What's going on everyone? Train Freak here and today I've got a original Atherin Genesis uh, Union Pacific EMD SD70M 
that I am installing sound in for a customer. So before I get to that, um, over here on to my left side, you can see the model railroad live streams uh, each day of the week. And looks like my thing's not playing. That's weird. Oh, well, that might be something I'll have to fix for next time. Um, but anyways, let me go ahead and get a few hellos out of the way while we got some people here. Oh, it is playing. It's like really super slow. That is so wild. Anyways, uh, so let's see who is here. Uh, first up, we got Humanity Junction saying thanks for the reminder, but he still might forget. I don't expect anything less from that. Uh, CP and CM model railroading and rail fanning is here. We got Lee Anfield Road layout in the loft, white curly. Roy Eltham, Joe Raider, Black Rock Central Railroad, Martin Sierzma, Norman Rowe, Steve Childers saying you can tell the youngster based on their theme music. Well, Steve, I can't use the regular music because if I did, then that's copyright infringement. So I have to go with actual non-copyrighted music. Uh, let's see. We've got Norman Rowe. Schuylkill River Valley is here. Let's see. Who else we got? And that's it. And Norman Rowe is saying the audio and video is fine. So that makes me feel really good. We got Jerry Satterelli here. Welcome, Jerry. All right. So, like I said, and we're going to be kind of shifting a few different uh, scenes here. But over here on my desk, I have this um, locomotive here. Uh, this is a EMD SD70M. This is an Atherin Genesis. Like I was saying earlier... Uh, Steve is saying it's not the copyright or not, it's the style. Okay, Steve. I, I just wanted to kind of pump you up and, you know, some techno. Man, you got to do it that way. Hey, uh, Mike Pringle's here. Welcome, Mike. All right, so one thing to note when you have a locomotive, especially one that has... Oops, if I can get it back in camera. Ditch lights. And these are actually working ditch lights um, on the front of the locomotive. You need to know which railroads used the ditch lights for the grade crossing logics and which ones did not. Now, Union Pacific does not have alternating flashing ditch lights. And you might say, wait a second, I have seen some Union Pacific locomotives that have those alternating flashing ditch lights. And yes, there are some out there, but those were not originally Union Pacific uh, locomotives. Those are actually locomotives that were acquired from the mergers of the Chicago Northwestern and Southern Pacific. Now, I know there's other railroads out there. I think CSX has them, Norfolk Southern has them as well. I'm not too sure about Canadian National or Canadian Pacific and KCS. Uh, never really uh, paid that much of attention as to which ones had the alternating ditch lights and which ones didn't. But as far as Union Pacific goes, like I said, if it's a UP built locomotive or if it was built for Union Pacific, they do not. If it was built for Southern Pacific, CNW announced wearing the UP paint, they still do have alternating flashlights or ditch lights, I mean. So the first thing that I had to do was you got to do a little bit of research and it's not real hard. So I'm actually going to show you how. So this locomotive's number is 4528. So one of my favorite websites to go to is Railroad Pictures Archives. And you can actually see here that, you know, it says um, EMD SD70M and it says built as UP4528 SD70M. So that will tell you, um, you know, that that is a straight up Union Pacific locomotive and it was built in 11, 2001. So for some of you that are sticking to a specific era, um, this is a really, really good site uh, to use. Um, because if I was to go and look up another type of locomotive, let's say, let's look at the Dash 9, for example. So C44 Dash 9W. You can look here and see that there's a whole bunch here that say like XSP, 
And then if we scroll down, we might see some XC and Ws in there as well. But they have like a whole bunch that are, you know, X, let's say 9615, for example. You can see it patched, you know, painted patch, scroll down, and you might even just see it in straight up yellow like that there. And so noting that this is UP 9615, but it was built as Southern Pacific 8151. So something, you know, good to kind of keep in your back pocket. All right. So, yes. So getting back to the chat. Um, flash, yeah, flashlights would be easier. That is no joke. And thank you, John, for posting that site up there. Um, and like I said, I use Railroad Pictures Archive um, in my back pocket for a lot of things. One, doing research on locomotives. But two, it's great for rolling. Yeah, just like Jerry said, rolling stock photos for when you're wanting to weather, whether it's a locomotive or rolling stock. Um, now, there are other sites out there, especially um, there's, there, there's some sites out there that are proprietary to a specific railroad. Uh, for me, I like uh, sprailfan.net, and it's not the letters SP, it's E-S-P-E-E. -E like the, the sound when you say it, but sbrailfan.net is great for uh, Southern Pacific, Cotton Belt, and TNO on not necessarily the rolling stock, but like locomotives and cabooses. So, turn my AC unit off because it's actually feeling really good in here right now. Now, if it heats up, I will go back and turn it back on. All right, so let's go ahead and let's get over to the local. Locomotive. All right, so, and I'm going to have to position a few things. And I've got my chat on my phone, so I should be able to kind of help keep up with some of the questions as they do come in. All right, so like I said, this is an Atherm Genesis, and it does have wired in ditch lights. So the first thing I'm going to do is I got to take the coupler boxes off. If I can get the right screwdriver, let's try this one. All right, maybe this one. I love how sometimes they give you the screws that you should be using, like a small screwdriver like that, and they still don't work, which tells me now I've got to go and grab my big screwdriver. And I probably should have tested that to begin with, but eh, we all make mistakes, right? Okay, so that one's not going to work either. All right, moment of truth. It's the last one I got before I got to go and find a screwdriver. Ah, there we go. I got one working now. And we're going to do this side as well because we got to get the shell separated from the chassis. We will be doing most of the work on the chassis itself. Now, I have not opened this locomotive, so I have no clue uh, exactly what is inside. So, your guess is as good as mine. It's not very often that I come across the older uh, Genesis locomotives. There we go. There's my screw. And then, like I said, once we take the coupler box out of uh, the front where the plowing stuff is. then our chassis should just come right off. All right. And it looks like I'm having some camera latency issues, so I apologize for that if that continues happening. 
All right, so let's see here. Yeah, that website is extremely easy to search. So Lynn McCurdy is Jason just messing around this morning. Absolutely. So today is Columbus Day, so happy Columbus Day to all of you. And um, because I work for local government, we're off on Columbus Day. So how about that? So I thought today I'll just get in and go live. All right, so now I'm just taking off the, the wires. I'm not going to take off all the lighting wires. I'm going to leave those on for the time being. But I am going to take out the rail connectors. And I'm going to also take out the motor feeds. So that way I can move the shell out of the way. Okay. So now I could have used like a TSU 2200 on that, popped off the Digitrax, popped that on there. Um, but when you do things like that, it kind of typically takes up more space and the connections are not as reliable. And then the other thing that we're doing on this locomotive is we're actually giving it an upgrade. We're actually going to go from a, uh, let's see, what is that, a 6 or a 4? That's a DH123, which I think is a 4 lighting function decoder, and we're going to go to an 8. So if the person in the future wants to go to more lighting functions, you know, add, um, you know, like an interior cab light or step lights, platform lights, truck lights, you name it, this person will have full capabilities of being able to do that in the future. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that the older Atherin locomotives use incandescent bulbs, not LEDs. Uh, if you go with like a, 20, a TSU 2200, then, um, and you don't have the board, you know, that will, you know, rectify the LEDs down, then uh, you can fry the decoder. But this one here has a built-in uh, 1.5 volt common where my um, blade is at. I know it's going to be kind of hard to see. Let's see if I can get that closer to the camera. Yeah, it's not going to be in focus very well. But it's the very far contact to the right along these long row of contacts because we got speaker... Uh, positive speaker, uh, negative, then functions three through eight, and then a 1.5 common. That 1.5 common is only for the um, the incandescent bulbs that come in the Athern locomotives. Okay. And so the next thing we're going to do, we're just going to take it and just snap it back on place. And we're going to start by tinning all of our wires and getting where they go. So hopefully this installation won't take near as long as the last one. The last one I had to do quite a bit of um, isolation on the motor and things like that and had to add a wire to the motor. This one here pretty much has everything, which is which is great. And if you are wondering, the flux that I'm using is Alpha OM 338. It does not cost me, it actually costs more to get this shipped because you have to keep it refrigerated. And so they have to put it in a box with dry ice and next day it to you. Yep, see, Lynn had to find out the hard way that the post office is closed on Columbus Day. Go ahead and get some solder on my contacts here. We're 
for flux, I mean. All right. And then the solder I'm using is, it's electrical solder by Burnsomatic. It's a lead-free, it's silver-bearing, it's rosin core. Um, this is a 3-ounce or 85-gram roll of solder. Um, so I've been using this stuff for the longest. It's really good stuff. So, Lynn, I think what it boils down to is the post office mail trucks that are out driving around are just delivering packages. Um, post office is, from my understanding, is trying to keep up with uh, UPS and FedEx, who are private companies. And the post office is, is no long. it's, I mean, for a while it has not been a government agency it's no longer a department of the federal government it's a private company that is owned by the federal government so that's probably why you see them doing that because i I've, I've been seeing them run on sundays as well and i remember when the post office used to never run on sundays is there an alternative to flux Refrigeration is not an option for me. Uh, Jerry, that's a good question. Uh, flux is pretty much like the glue or the magnet for uh, solder. So I really don't know, you know, if there is anything else. Um, but that's a, that's a good question. Now, what I'm doing right now is just tinning my wires. And then I'm going to get some flux. Or I got the flux on the contacts. I'm just going to put a little bit of solder on the contacts. And get a little bit more on that one. Here we go. Just to have a good bubble so that way I've got a place to stick my wire. There we go. <clears throat> All right. Now the next thing I'm going to do is take these wires. And because these are up under the board. Let's see. Did that solder good? Yeah, solder good. I'm just going to use a pair of tweezers because the wires are pretty short. And that seems to help. But sometimes short wires is really good like when you try to put everything back together. Sometimes I will take the locomotive and spin it around instead of trying to work on the opposite side. This one did not grab very well. Reflux that one. There we go. All right. And so just like that, I've got all four rail connections wired in. So if I was to put this on a piece of track right now, I would be able to get the blue light that would come on the board. 
Oh, Lord, I got to behave now. I got my better half uh, watching me. Hi, Amanda. And then Andy Dorch. Welcome, Andy. And we got Drew Dudes Model Train. So I do not use refrigerating flux. This is electrical flux. I know typically a lot of plumbers will use this as well. You got plumbing flux too. Um, but the main thing is, is you want a rosin core solder, silver bearing, and free of lead. You don't want that lead. Oh, okay. So Amanda's out there getting her steps in today. Okay, so now the next thing I'm going to do is take the wires, which should be on the other side of the decoder. And these are for the motor connections. And that's going to be the next batch that I put in. And I'm going to have to strip a little bit of wire on that one. There we go. Let's see, how does this one look? For some odd reason, it's like the motor wires, they just barely leave you enough copper to work with. Okay. Stick those in me flux. There we go. Split rock. What's going on, buddy? Now, a good question for split rock is, and that's even if he even keeps up with uh, all the different locomotives he drives because he is an engineer for Union Pacific. Now you're going to have to go and look at and see if you have driven a uh, locomotive 4528, and that is an SD70M. Because if you have, then you are you have driven the locomotive that I am putting a decoder on. Okay. Pretty much. I'm sure you have lost count of all the different locomotives you have driven. That that wouldn't surprise me actually. All right, so now we got our motor wires soldered up. <clears throat> and do your best not to inhale smoke. Because solder smoke is definitely not good for you. All right, and then what I did was I took the last bit of the wires... And I just tucked them under the board and above the plastic piece that for the motor clip. Just so that way they would be out of our way. Okay. Thanks, Andy. I really appreciate that. All right. So now we've got... The rail pickups and the motor connections. So now we get to go and do the very, very fun part. So I'm actually going to take my whole cradle and spin it around. 
because I like to use this section here to kind of hold some of my tools and things that I need. And I've got a big flat uh, connection right there that I don't necessarily need everything on. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop one of these um, clips off and pull that wire out. And I'm going to go ahead and tin that wire. These are uh, actually going to the backup lights. So that way I can go ahead and get those soldered in. Now, right here on these back two connectors, there is a rectangular connector. And then there is an oval, well, not connector, but contacts, I mean, a rectangular contact and an oval contact. The front side also has the same, a rectangular contact and an oval contact. The oval contacts on both sides are your lighting commons if you have LEDs. It's a three volt, I think it's a three volt connection. Uh, if George was watching me, he could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's three volt. And... The contact here is going to go to the front headlight, and then the, this back contact here goes to the back headlight. But since now we're using these incandescent bulbs that come in these Atherin locomotives, instead of using these oval contacts, we're going to actually send all of the common wires to this one single 1.5 volt common there. And what I'll probably do on that is run a very short wire to bridge um, just to kind of help make it the soldering connection a little bit cleaner. So what I'm going to do now is I am going to put some flux on this contact, the rectangular one, and we're going to put in a solder bubble or a bead or whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to take that wire And as we get it hot, we're going to try to stick that wire down through the hole that is already there. There we go. Wait for that to dry. Plastic's really hot. Woo! That's a little warm. And there we have that wire. Alright, the next one I'm going to grab is, let's see here, function one positive, okay, so function one positive, and I think that actually is supposed to go back to the common if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that one's supposed to go back to the common. So this one I'm not going to mess with, I'm going to take the other one off. This is the one I want. So on this old Digitrax board, it's listed as function one. We're here on the Soundtracks one. We're going to go to function three. All right, so I went ahead and tinned my wire. Now these contacts are so close together that sometimes I will take a toothpick and scoop up the flux that I want. And just get it only on that one contact that I need it on. Yes, hon, I remember not to inhale. I try to exhale as the smoke is coming in my direction. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stick that wire in. See if I can't try to get it to hold down maybe sometimes they say helping hands help sometimes it don't and just get a bead a solder and bam there you go just like that Okay, now we just got to do 
the headlight. And we will go ahead and tin this one too. Split rock, that's probably because you always sit down wind from the campfire. It would not surprise me if that was the case. All right, so on the front headlight, we're going to go to that front section of the board. Or the front rectangular contact, because we're not messing with the oval. Get some solder on my soldering iron. And tap it in like so. Hmm. Oh Lord, Norman. Yeah, you can't forget about the beans. Definitely can't forget about that. All right, so now we've got our ditch lights, the headlight, and the backup light. We've got those lights all wired to their respective... Function output, now the fun part. We get to take the other side of those headlights, and they all have to be wired to a common. So now I just got to get the rest of the wires off this old decoder board that we're not going to use. And depending on how big these connections are when I twist them together will depend on if I choose to use a small piece of wire to wire to these or if I will just solder the whole pad or solder all these wires to that pad. All right. I think I got them all. And let's get some flux on this so we can tin all that together as one solid piece of wire. Oh, yeah, that looks really good. I still think that's going to be tough to get into that spot. So let's see if I've got some tubing that I can use to fit. I don't know if that will fit in my tubing or not. Nope. Tubing too small. All right. So we're going to just try to go for the home run. How about that? All right, see if I can get some solder. Because, see, I have, like, an electrical piece or some type of thing right beside this contact, which makes it real tricky. Even with the fine point, it would still make it tricky. All right, let me get that wire out of the way. All right, y'all, moment of truth. All right, there you go. So that should be all of the wires soldered up. I just need to make sure it's not resting, and it's not. So we're good.
<laughs> Norman, I, uh, I don't think the electrical strikes are going to be the better part. I was going to go more along the lines of uh, flames, actual fires. Did I say Bam Bam? I thought I said Wham Bam. I might have said Bam Bam. Welcome, Bernard. How are you doing, buddy? All right. So that is all wired up except for one last thing. And that is the speakers. And we're going to go with a couple of mini cubes. I'm going to put one towards the front of the locomotive and another one towards the back of the locomotive. Now, when wiring in multiple speakers, um, especially if they're one watt, so you can get the, a two watt total, uh, you need to make sure that you wire these in series and not parallel. Parallel is a big no-no. Well, Bernard, we haven't put it on the track yet. So we're not 100% out of the woods yet. Heath, oh, Heath, for some odd reason, Heath has that effect on me. And I have yet to figure out how to break it. All right, so I've got my handy-dandy helping hands down here, so I'm putting a speaker on it. And for those that are curious how that actually looks, uh, it's just a piece of masonite with a clothespin backwards. And so it makes a really good helping hand. So pretty cool DIY project. I can't take credit for it. Uh, when I went to the Soundtracks training class, they actually gave me this. So... Very true, Split Rock. And see, you know, Heath is in there lurking. He's waiting for the smoke. So if you haven't seen the smoke from the solder joints, then Heath, I guess you kind of lost out, man. All right. So I'm going to use some super small wire if I'm a snips and see if I can't. Trim this wire back. There we go. And get the toothpick to get some of that flux on these contacts. That always helps. Yeah, I see. I want to go ahead and get that tinned as well. All right, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. All right, so the top is positive. The bottom is negative. So that is sometimes you do have to pay attention on some of the speakers, what's positive and what's neg. Oh, come on. Get in there. Because sometimes that does matter. And that's got too much wire showing. Perfect. Let's see how this looks. So that way y'all can see that wire just hanging off. There you go. So now I got to do the other one. Let's see, how long is this one? Oh, okay. That's going to be my bridging wire there. We'll do that then. All right, so now I need a shorter wire. We're going to go red on this one. 
Yeah, that'll be long enough. Some of us are not off today. Ah. So the clothespin, it's a it's a helping hand. So you can use it to hold things. So here I'm holding this little speaker that's magnetic. So that way when I get the soldering iron close to it, the speaker doesn't move and try to to go. So instead of going to Amazon and buying a helping hand, you can go get you 100 pack of clothespins. Well, here we go. Yeah, 100 clothespins for $2 at the dollar store, at Dollar General or Family Dollar. And you can make as many of those that you want. Mystic John, what's going on, buddy? Welcome to the Monday Chaos. All right. It might help if I had some solder on the iron. Get, get a little bit on there. There we go. All right, we got one speaker wired in. Now we got to wire in the other one. Norman, that too. And then um, the reason why I bought all of those is to make trees. If you buy the Scenic Express uh, Super Trees, one of the things that you have to do is let the trees dry upside down on a clothesline. And they say to use clothespins. So who would have thunk it? And we're going to go to this one. Get some flux on that wire. There we go. And I want a shorter blue. There we go. That will work. Yes. That's right. To hang up the trees to dry. Yeah, I still got a bead on there. So that's perfect. All right, so now I've got our two speakers wired up in series. And what I did was I used a red wire for the positive, a blue wire for the negative, and then it doesn't matter which wire that you use in the middle. Um, for this instance, I had a lot, you know, an extra blue wire because I think I used red on the last one. So because you're literally going from negative of one to the positive of the next. But I do recommend two different colors. Uh, for what's going to the board so that way you know what's going to the board all right now the fun part is getting these soldered in and it's going to be these two contacts here we got speaker positive to uh, the right 
or yeah, all the way to the right, speaker negative to the left. And so this is one of those instances where the contacts are so close together that it's just best to use um, a toothpick to spread the, uh, the flux on it. All right, so let's see if I can get a bead without bridging anything and it looks like I did perfect all right so we're going to do negative first might help if I have my wire stripped Is Heath a negative or a positive? Um, I'm going to let y'all vote on that. If I knew how to pull up a vote like Heath does on his live streams, and it might be one of those features that you have to be at a 1,000 subscribers to be able to do it, um, I would definitely put that poll up there and let y'all choose. Is Heath a negative or is he a positive? I think that would be a pretty cool poll. All right, that wire is in. Now for the positive. That wire is also in. And sometimes when you have wires that stick below, these uh, snips work real good to cut that excess wire off so that way you don't have bridging between your wires all right so decoder is done now the fun part is going to get the speakers up underneath and so what i like to use is some of this double-sided tape by scotch and it's 3M. And pretty good stuff. And I will put some tape on the baffles. So that way once I get the baffle up in the shell, that will hold my speakers in place now the fun part is is when you have all this here extra wiring getting them in there can sometimes be a pain in the butt and I'm gonna have to go all the way to the very back on this back speaker because I have to be careful of the uh, the chassis Let's see if I can get that one turned sideways, maybe. Ah, there we go. And then this one, let's see, where do we want to put this one? I might be limited just to one. There is that possibility. Because I do have part of the chassis, but I think I'm going to try to fit this one in right here. If the shell doesn't go all the way on, then I will have to take this speaker here out. But we do want to try to go for two on this one. Because it just sounds so much better when you have two speakers. Okay. Moment of truth. See if we can get the chassis on. And y'all, it looks like we are in business. That truck moves freely. That truck moves freely. So now... 
Let's see. Hey, we got uh, JD in the house. John Dilly. Grandpa Rails. What's going on, JD? Norman said Heath is bipolar. That's funny. That that's hilarious. Bipolar. That that might be the best answer. You know, if we really think about it. Okay, so I have some couplers. We're going to put some KDs on this bad boy. Who doesn't like KDs, right? That is a very, very good um, comment, Thomas. Um, it is a UP engine. You know, I did see something, and if I was to ever own a Union Pacific engine, I would totally do this. Uh, somebody took the U on Union and changed it into an O and called it the Onion Pacific. And it had a tagline. They graffitied a tagline under it and said, Service that will make you cry. And I saw that, and I about... I about had to come apart. I was laughing so hard. Ah, of course, I'm going to drop the screw. These are always the hardest screws to get in. And it's because you got the snow plow to work against. There we go. All right, we got coupler number one on the locomotive. That is not exactly what I said, Heath. Hey, I've got friends that work for UP. Besides, you know, Thomas at Split Rock, I got a lot of friends who work for UP. And these are people that have worked for both uh, Missouri Pacific, Southern Pacific, and Cotton Belt in the area. All right, and there is my other coupler. Okay, so we have officially finished the decoder installation on this locomotive so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to take a quick break so that way i can get things set up so y'all just stay here in the chat and i will be right back while i make a few uh camera adjustments
am back. Let me get my mic over here. Here we go. All right. Can everyone hear me pretty well? Can Inscale hold a current keeper? Split Rock, the answer to that one is going to be no. But you can put a single capacitor in there, and that will help. Uh, but you're probably going to have to mill out a whole bunch of the frame. So, yeah. So, Roy, I'm curious. Is this like the big U50 that is the BBBB uh, axle setup, or is it a U50C? So, that's what I'm wondering. Now, Roy is saying, yes, it can. Are you talking about the current keeper? Because let me grab you a current keeper. I've got them right here. Uh, somewhere. All right. Well, let me show it this way. Okay, so Roy's talking about the 8-axle uh, U50. This is a N-scale decoder. And it comes with a capacitor. So the capacitor is actually kind of like your current keeper per se. Um, but it's not a full-fledged current keeper. The full-fledged current keepers are actually five of those capacitors, either in a row or in a two-by-three arrangement. So there's a difference between the current keeper and just a single capacitor. Uh, well, the thing with the Soundtrack's current keeper is, Roy, is they actually have extra electronics on there so it doesn't backfeed uh, into the system because if, uh, let's say you got 10 locomotives on there and they're just capacitors and you load the system up, the, the system will think that there is an overflow of a voltage going on, so it might not necessarily short your system out, but uh, make it think. I, George is the one who explained it to me, so I'm having a hard time trying to remember exactly what he told me because that was like a year ago, two years ago when he explained that to me. So, Blaine Hooks. Hello, Train Freak. I'm new here. Well, welcome, Blaine. So, yes, Heath is right. This is what it's called, inrush current, and it will actually trigger... Your system, whether it's uh, NCE Digitracks, I'm pretty sure DigiKeys would see the same thing, um, MRC, and it just basically temporarily shuts the system down, but it will bring it right back up. So, and yes, you can add a diode in the right place, and that's basically what Soundtracks did on their current keepers. Uh, Mason Dixon Railroad, welcome, welcome. All right. Uh, what about in a tender on a steam or a B unit on a diesel? You can do that. And I have seen people in N scale take a box car and attach it to the back of a diesel locomotive and do it that way too. So you do have extra options. Um, of course, the only thing about doing the box car is, is it's going to be constantly behind your locomotive 24 seven, uh, 365. But I've done that for a customer in the past. So you do have that option as well. But if I could actually find one of my current keepers, the actual current keepers, I would be glad to show you how much bigger they actually are. And I might be out of stock on them. Yeah, it looks like it. But it's basically, like I said, five of those capacitors in a row or in a two by three formation. So... 2x3 is actually really good when it comes to uh, like Jeep style locomotives. Um, they fit like right, you know, like if you got a high nose, for example, they fit great up in that front nose. Is there a way to make units free rolling without overloading current? Um, you might, I might have you reword that. I don't know exactly what you're asking. Uh, free rolling. Are you talking about like making it a dummy unit? Um, if you got a dummy unit, then it's not going to be pulling any current at all. So I'm curious what you're meaning by free rolling. Okay. 
so let's get into uh, programming. So I've got the locomotive sitting on the uh, track in front of you. And I know my camera's a little blurry, uh, so I apologize, but it's there and we will be able to see it move. Um, Heath has got a big nose, not a high nose. So there you go. So Blaine's saying, I don't have any engines, but I want to get one, get some soon. Okay. Um, probably best bet is um, you could either save up for a really, really nice engine, depending on what scale you're on, and get something brand new. Uh, all right, Split Rock, take care, buddy. Uh, I know you got to get back to jury duty, so have fun with that. Um, but Blaine, uh, you could either do that or maybe try to find a used one to at least get you up and going and then, um, you can do the safe thing. All right. So I just turned my system on. So good news is, is I'm hearing sound. Um, I don't know if y'all are going to be able to hear this or not. Okay, so are y'all able to hear the uh, prime mover from the locomotive? I'm not getting any responses yet, so I'm assuming that is a negative. You out in 21 pin heard it. Okay. So they're hearing it. And no, this is not a 21 pin. This is actually a PMP board, Jack Jack. But I can do 21 pins. That's no biggie. So, and he, he never hears anything. So I, I can't, I have to take what he says with a grain of salt. All right. Let me go grab my throttle. All right, now we got a horn. And we have a bell. There we go. And I've got some interference going on with my throttle, so I don't know where that's coming from. Uh, we can just blame that on Heath. So I don't have the microphone right up by the locomotive. All right, so we're just going to do some basic testing. We're going to see if it moves forward. All right, it moves forward. And we got dirty track. Always we got dirty track. Okay. And let's see if we can do it this way. All right. And it moved in reverse. There we go. All right. So, unlike Heath, we don't have smoke. Sorry, Heath, to uh, disappoint you on that one. All right, JD, take care, buddy. You have a good one. And Heath, yes, it is completely out of focus because this is an old, old camera that does not focus very well, I can tell. So maybe one of these days I'll be able to save up and actually get me another good camera. Um. Let's see, I don't know if... Yeah, so what I'm actually using is called this Droid Cam Client. Heath is the one who actually recommended me to use this. And um, yeah, so that's why I can't get it to focus. I don't know if it'll let me focus it from the phone or not. Light balance exposure log.
Yeah, I could probably move the camera just a tad bit closer, and that might help. Not like you're really going to be able to see, like, uh, the lights or anything like that. Move a couple of things out of the way, and I'll move the camera just a tad bit closer. All right, is that, hopefully that's better. Now, Heath, now me and you've had that conversation. Get a GoPro 8. I have one, but until GoPro gets off their rear end and tells me how to get it connected to my computer as a webcam, and I have contacted support, and they are stumped, um, like their tech support just gave up on me, so... Yeah, I'm not too happy with GoPro about that. <sighs> good times, good times, good times. All right. So, like I said, it moves forward and it moves in reverse. And I know I've got dirty, dirty track. Let's see here. Oh, yeah, that's good and dirty. All right, there we go. So, like I said, let's get back into programming because there's a few things we need to look at, especially when you're wanting to program a sound type locomotive. So, the first thing I like to do is actually look up the model. And so, I just Googled EMD SD70M. And a lot of times, Wikipedia will give you some good information, not always. But you can come over here and see that they have, um, you know, what prime ever did they use? Now, you've got the two-stroke diesel and a four-stroke diesel, which is for the SD70 Ace uh, Tier 4. Um, but what we are wanting is just, well, this is the EMD SD70 Series. I need a 70M. So, like I said, sometimes their website is not as good, but the diesel shop, they're pretty good on their stuff. So, uh, definitely a good site to go to, and it tells you all of the information that you need to know. So, what I'm looking for is the prime mover that is inside this locomotive. Let's see, traction weight, traction, multiplier, bore stroke, engine. So here we go, engine. So they call it an engine. So this is the 710G3B or 710GC or G3C-T2. It's a 16-cylinder. So knowing that, um, then we can go to the... Not the TSU Diesel's User Guide, but let's see. Steam Sound Selector, Alco. Okay, so we're going to go to Soundtracks' website. And go to Reference. And we want Documentation. Oh, Manuals. And what I want is a Tsunami 2 Digital Sound Decoder. And I'm going to go down here to the EMD Sound Selection Reference. And while I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and add that to my folder. So that way I've got it. And these will tell you all the different type of horns, bells, prime movers, air compressors, and poppet valves. The blue ones are your default. So the prime mover that we are needing for this one is this EMD 710 G3C-T2. So one of the first things I'm going to go ahead and do is we're going to program this locomotive, program number 3, CV, and this is CV123. And I'm going to set that to func or CV8. And doing that, it's going to reboot the prime mover to the proper prime mover. And like I said, I don't know if y'all were able to hear that or not. Um, but yeah. 
So this is, like I said, this is for a customer. He's paying me because he wants not the locomotive to look prototypical, but he wants it to sound prototypical. All right. So we did that. Um, oh, of course, when it popped up the new tab, it didn't share. So let me let me change my share real quick so that way y'all can see that. Sorry. Uh, someone should have told me in chat. Heath, where are you at, man? All right. Share screen. Chrome tab. All right. So this is what the document looks like. So my apologies. Um, so for the sound selector, for the Tsunami 2, for EMD diesel types, here's all your different part numbers. This is CV120, all the different type of horns you can put on there. Yes, they even have a Uga horn, which I thought was pretty funny. Uh, all your different bells. They have a bell for the Rio Grande Southern Ga Galloping Goose. So, different ones there. And, of course, the Prime Movers. And like I said, this one we did CV8 for this EMD 710 G3C T-2. So, all right. So, let's go ahead and go and look up the next thing I need to share with you. Thank you, Norman. I uh, greatly appreciate that. Okay, so next thing we're going to need is the Tsunami 2 Diesel User's Guide. So let me share that with you as well. Okay, so now we're looking at this. And this, I'm, I'm telling you, it's an 87-page document. So does require a lot of reading in here if you want to be able to program it the way you want. First thing I'm going to do is, and I'm actually programming this in ops mode. I am not using a programming track um, because as long as you don't have anything on the track that has the same address, then it's only going to program to the address that you tell it to program to. So I'm going to go ahead and program the address, the long address, to 4528. All right, I'm on 4528, and we have a horn. So that's good news. We've also got a bell. All right, so we configured the address. Now we're going to start configuring the decoder. We're just going to kind of look at a few things. Um, CV29 is just basic configuration, but... If you are wanting your locomotive to work for both DCC and DC or just for DC, this is something that you have to enable. It's the alternate power source or analog mode. Now, the thing about the analog mode is it, for some odd reason, does not work with the current keeper. But any locomotive that you buy directly from Athern um, that comes, you know, with a sound decoder in it, whether it's the economy for the ready to rolls or the Genesis with the tsunami twos, um, this is automatically enabled. And I learned the hard way that once I put a current keeper in there, it actually does some weird things when it actually loses power, it causes it to go down in the shutdown sequence. So, but this is something to keep in mind. We're not going to use this for uh, DC, so I'm not going to mess with it. Um, these are just different tables and things like that. So you configure throttle and braking. So this is where you can do your start voltage, your momentum. I am going to put in some momentum. So the first one I am going to mess with is CV3. And let's see here. Somewhere on here they say what is a good number to use. That's DDE load compensation, which I'm not worried about. Independent brakes, train brakes, dynamic brake. A lot of information. Here we go. Example prototypical braking. So CV3, is, we're going to set that to a value of 45. So this is some of the things that I'll do is all of this right here. And I know, oh, someone's fired. Who got fired? Heath, you're fired. So, not me. 
All right. So I'm going to start here at number one. I'm basically going to set CV3 to a value of 45. So this is your acceleration. So that way when it starts accelerating and you go at, and, you know, you put your throttle at like speed step 20, it will gradually get to speed step 20. It will not just jolt off the dime. And then uh, CV4, which is your braking or deceleration rate. I'm going to put in 75 because a train, it takes a longer time for a train to slow down than to accelerate. And that's because of all that weight behind it. All right. And let's see. Now, if we're using independent braking, which is locomotive braking, we basically want a more rapid brake on that than if we were using a train brake. So we can go and set CVs 117 to a value of 178. 255 is the max. Um, but because the entire train takes a longer time to bring it to a stop than just the locomotive, we're going to take CV 118, which is for train braking, and set it to 100 for a more gradual braking rate. And then uh, you also got dynamic brakes if you choose to enable it. Uh, we can set that. That's CV116. We'll set that to a value of 60. Because dynamic braking is designed for gradual braking, but it does not bring the locomotive to a stop. Now, when using uh, a soundtrack's Yes, I know you're just looking at the manual because when I'm programming, you really can't see the locomotive doing anything. I'm just telling you what all I'm putting in the system, and it's just easier to go with the manual, Heath. So, yes, and I am referring to it. So the page that I'm actually on... Thank you, Norman. I was a very good student. I did get my certificate and passed the test on the first... Well, the first test that they assigned me, I did pass. So I had to pay attention to something, I guess. Uh, but yeah, when you're running a light locomotive or consist of only locomotives, you apply the appended, the independent brake with function 11, which is default. And then the brake select function 12 must be turned off for the independent brake to be applied. So function 11 is your independent brake. Your train brake is function 12. When you run a complete train, apply the train brake with the train brake function 11 by default. The brake select function must be turned on for the train brake to be applied. And then turning on the brake function or brake select function will cycle the air compressor to simulate charging the train line. So it's got really, really neat features in here for that to work. Now, the only time that the train will stop on a dime is when you hit that emergency stop button, you know, like if you got a derail. So it does do that. Uh, setting the three-point speed curve, I really don't mess with that, but this is something if you want to mess with, you can. Um, CV2 is your V-start. Uh, CV5 uh, is your V-high. And CV6 is your V-mid. If you're doing like a small switching layout and not doing any type of mainline runs, that might be good for you to mess with there. Um, you can set a custom speed table, but that is a lot of work, and I'm not doing all of that. Same for motor trim. Uh, lighting outputs. Uh, so these are the different functions for different lights. Uh, we got CV49 for your headlight, CV50 for the backup light, CV51 for your FX3 config, which remember I wired the ditch lights to it. Um, you can change different lighting functions to all of that. Um, you've also got your CV60 is your gray crossing hold time. Uh, so that way you can put your gray crossing um, stuff in there. And see, you know, if you did have the alternating ditch lights you would actually have one headlight or one ditch light wired to fx3 the other one wired to fx4 and so you would actually make that notation where fx3 is grade crossing a fx4 is grade crossing b because okay so heath i'm actually using the actual throttle i do not use a program i like to program manually so for you um I do not use JMRI. I just use the throttle. 
So if you want me to set the camera up on the throttle, I can do that. All right, keep going. We're going to pass all that because we don't really have to deal with the lighting. Now, if you are using LEDs, this is something to keep in mind. Uh, LED compensation mode. Uh, whichever lighting outputs you are putting with LEDs, you do want to add a value of 128 to your um, to the light type that you're choosing to use. So, but of course, you need to research your railroad as to what type of lights they use. All right, my favorite part: sound effects. Selecting the primary air horn. Um, show you a few different ones. And we could go back to the sound selector. Let's see here. GE EMD sound selections here. And these are all the different air horns we got. And I'm just going to pop up another tab real quick and see if that one website uh, did tell us what type of air horn they used. I'm sure um, Split Rock would know this, but he went back to um, jury duty, so I'm sure he can't really tell me. Well, Heath, unfortunately for you, you like DigiKeys, which I think you like the digit. You like DigiKeys, which I think you use, what, either the TCS or Digitrax throttles. You do all this with the NCE, and it's just a breeze. And Boulder Creek, James, I definitely agree with you. Soundtracks is such a pain to use with a programmer. If you program it in ops mode with the throttle, um, they most of the time they do not respond on a programming track. He's absolutely right, and the people at Soundtracks will tell you that. But there is one thing that you can program in this locomotive. It's called Digital Dynamic Exhaust, which I will get to later, that you cannot program on a programming track because of, it is required for the locomotive to actually be in motion to program it. So that's why we always program it on ops mode, and JMRI Decoder Pro cannot also program the Digital Dynamic Exhaust. And for those who do not know what Digital Dynamic Exhaust is, it's basically where the locomotive auto notches based upon the amp stall of the motor inside the locomotive. JMRI Dakota Pro does have its perks, but like I said, I do not use it. I do it all manually, and that's how Soundtracks has trained us. So I'm not seeing on this website that I showed y'all earlier about the type of horn that this locomotive has. So we're just going to go and pick one. Um, I'm thinking a K5 LA might be probably one of the better ones to use. Um, because this locomotive doesn't even have a horn on it, on the top. So someone has broke the horn off. All right, so for CV120, we're just going to choose this K5LA, the first one that's, that's going to be a CV value of four. So just to let you hear what the horn sounds like now, that is a K3LA. All right, CV number, and we're going to do CV120 and value of four. And this is our new horn. So it's got more of a, it's got five chimes instead of three chimes. Yeah, the horn is in the cab with the engineer, you're right. They might have put it down in the short hood and put it in the bathroom. For all those who don't know where the bathroom's at. All right, so I'm going to go back and let's see here. We're on sound effects. And we've already done the prime mover, which I showed you, the bell. The rest of the stuff I'm just going to leave alone. Well, let's see here. Okay, yeah, that's all lighting. 
So CV114 auto notching, and it also has what's called enable engine interlock and enable auto start. So these are three things to really keep in mind. And the enable auto start, these are one of the features I really hate. Because as soon as I turn the layout on or as soon as I put the locomotive on the track, it wants to boot up. And maybe I don't want it booting up, you know, when I first start it. So this enable auto start here, which has a value of 32 into CV114, we're going to take out. However... I do want to add a value of 16 to that same CV value for engine interlock, meaning that if the locomotive is not on, it's not going to move. And then for the DDE, for the enable manual notching and auto notching functions, we're going to want CV114 set up to a value of, let's see here, the max see, zero to what is it? Uh, 15, value of 15. So we're going to go for a value of 32 plus a value of 15, uh, 16. No, sorry, a value of 16 and a value of 32. And that's how we're going to do that one. So we're going to program, program locomotive 4528, CV 114. And we are going to do func or CV value of 31. So that's 15 for enable manual notching and 16 for the enable engine interlock. Yep, see, James knows exactly what I'm talking about. All right, so Heath wants to know how I did that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take you off the screen share and show you how simple oops how simple this is all right so let's see here if i can do this oh i'm not getting a good light all right let me switch over to the other camera then heath you causing a lot of problems buddy all right Let's see if you can see the screen. All right, so you can see the screen there, right? So there's a button on the bottom here that says program. So we're going to hit program, program loco on main. And so I'm going to come up here and I'm going to hit enter. Now it's got the last locomotive that I selected, which is 4528. So I'm going to hit enter again. It's asking me one for address, two for CV, three for config. I am going to press the two button. Enter CV number. We're going to go one, one, four, and we are going to hit enter. Now, remember that I put a value of 31 in there because I just put it in. But I'm going to go ahead and put 31 in there again. 31, enter, and it's programmed. That is how simple it is. James, you are welcome. All right, so let's get back to our user guide. And of course, you got the dynamic braking modes in there as well um, that we can also add to that. And it might be a good idea to go ahead. Um, so... Value of 31, and let's say, and we're going to want to put the locomotive at a value of 64 uh, for the, to set it to notch one, which is idle when you turn on the dynamic brake function. So, so now we're actually going to change CV114. to a value of 95. Now, the way I got 95 is we're going to take the 64 here. We're going to add it to the 16 here. And then this is CV114 is 0 to 15 with 15 being the highest. We're going to add 15 to that as well. So 64, 16, and 15 uh, comes up to be 95.
Now, the only difference, uh, Heath, is Digitrax, um, especially if you're using the DCS-50, you have to convert from decimal to hexadecimal. That's where a lot of people mess up with Digitrax. So, and I know that because I used to have Digitrax in the past. Now, the newer, bigger Digitrax systems, it might not be that much of a pain, but the other one the older ones yes uh you can also adjust your volume levels each of the different sounds the horn prime mover bell um here's all the different sounds lots of different types of sounds you can adjust the volumes from zero to 255 and yes they do have a toilet flush I don't know if any of the other sound decoders have a toilet flush, but, you know, locomotives did have a toilet in them. But see, the thing is, uh, Heath, when it comes to JMRI, they do not include everything that Soundtrax has. So, well, Heath, I am in the future. I'm using NCE, which is the power of DCC. And you can also enable quiet mode if you want quiet mode in there. Um, so another one of the features I like is the auto braking, sometimes the auto bail. Um, not everybody likes the auto bail, but I really do like the auto braking feature. And this is CV197. Um, so it's got three different values, two, four, and six, two for auto bail, four for auto brake, and six if you want both the bail and the brake. Two plus four equals six, right? So this is actually one I will go in and add onto this locomotive. Uh, let's see here. CV197. And I just want the auto braking, so four. All right, so I've got that one in. No, uh, Norman, I think uh, Heath has had his Wheaties this morning. Uh, Heath, I don't have to take my NC throttle, NCE throttle apart because it doesn't need to be updated. It is fully up to date. That just shows you how advanced NCE is because it doesn't have to be updated. All the other systems have to be caught up to it. So, see, Roy knows. All right, so if you got using like a passenger train, you can even adjust the coach door count. So for those who like Amtrak or the old school passengers, you can add that to a passenger style locomotive like a GG1 in the Tuscan Red, for example. Um, even the Blackjack if you wanted to. Heath, my, my throttle has all the features that you can think of. What new features are out there? Oh, Roy is saying he's being sarcastic. Roy, I thought you was on my side. All right, you can even customize the clickety-clack. Um, the default is... Uh, CV, CV31, or let's see here. So this can get confusing. So this is something that I would like to show y'all. Anytime that you look in the manual and you see where it says like CV3.257, so there is an index, which is CV31 and CV32. So CV32 is the bigger index. So anytime you see CV, like a number dot, number you have to go into cv32 and change that index uh, so that way you access those extra cv values um, because there's only 255 values so the way uh, soundtrack says or 255 cvs so the way soundtrack says combated that is um well not 255 i think it's 512 maybe 512 cvs yeah so they configure 32 to be indexes and so we have been on index one as a default. So to customize the clickety clack, we would actually need to change our index to three and then it's CV257. So it's not CV3257, 
it's CV257 in index of three. So, oh, that's nice, Roy. Well, guys, I have been with the NCE for the longest. Um, you know, it's worked perfectly for me for 10 plus years. Why would I want to change, you know? Especially into a system that they're still, you know, trying to figure some kinks out. And I'm not saying mine is better than any others. It's more or less like I used to have Digitrax in years past. I did not like their system at that time. Went to NCE and loved it. Um, now I have used MRC at the hobby shop. I was not a fan of that one either. Um, it's definitely got some quirks, but you know, digi keys I have not used. I mean, so who knows? I might like digi keys, but NCE, the, when they designed their system, they designed it for programming and that's mostly what I do. But you know, like, you know, like James is saying, if you're using JMRI, it is harder with the NCE, but that's why I do it all manually anyways, because that's how I've been taught, and that's how I actually learned years ago. SVO, you'll have to explain what SVO is, James. Heath, haven't you heard the saying, why fix something that ain't broken? If it ain't broken, don't fix it. All right. Um, so, yeah, I want to go ahead and I'm not going to mess with the clickety clack, but we can add that if we wanted to. For this locomotive, we would have to take CV32, set it to three. So that way we're in index three and then take CV257, set it to a value of six because we have three axles per trucks and two trucks per car or locomotive so yep and see everyone has their their perks you know like steve childers loves his jmri with digitrax all right and let's see we're gonna scroll on down Audio control, this is like the your mixer uh, on the decoder, you know, where you got different, um, what is it, the kilohertz and different hertz. Uh, equalizer, that's it. So you can fully adjust the seven, holy smokes, I don't know what happened there. The seven band equalizer. Yeah, here we go. I just do not know what happened to my mouse. That was wild. All right. So this is just kind of some things. They do have the equalizer control register that you can put in there. Like if you have, you know, a small speaker, medium speakers, large speakers, or you can set that value of 255 to 7. And we are back in index 1, so it would be 1.250 or 1.225. All these numbers, man, it's just, they they just come. You can even go and set your reverb in there as well. If you want a short reverb, which is defaulted, medium long, and you can even put echoes on it. So you can make it your trial sound like it's going through a tunnel 24-7. All right, John, take care, buddy. You have a good one. So, Steve, the only thing about ESU I do not like, and I haven't heard the new ESU version 5, so maybe they fixed that, is the ESU sounds that have come in all of these locomotives just sound very tinny. They sound very weak. And I have two locomotives that have that in there. And Prime Mover sounds great. Just that horn just sounds like junk.
Well, Heath, get you one, bud. They don't cost that much. I think they're like $150, $200. All right, and let's see here. Function mapping is the next thing. All right, so here's that digital dynamic exhaust or dynamic digital exhaust thing that I was talking about earlier. So this is where we have to set CV32 to 2 to get into the second level of indexes. And like I was saying, they give you the steps of exactly how to set it up. And it does require your locomotive to actually be moving. Because if you look at step six, we have to set the throttle to speed step one. And then on step eight, we increase the locomotive to speed step 25, between 25 and 40 on a 128 speed step. So, Roy, and that is the main kicker when it comes to the sound, it's the speakers. Hey, what's going on, Flying Crow? Yes, I do have a government job. But my government job's not like Steve Childers. It's not retirement. So. And so, you know, that, and that's the big thing between soundtracks and ESU. You can make ESU sound the way you want it to sound. So I'm not going to knock them on that. The difference is, is ESU, if you want it to sound the way you want it to sound, you have to buy that programmer, which is an extra money, and then you have to upload your sound files to the decoder and program it. Soundtracks, they give you all the sound files you need. So, uh, in Arkansas, they call it Columbus Day. I think it's the same holiday that is recognized in the other 49 states and six territories of the United States. Oh, good point, James. It's really JMRI doing all the programming for you. It's not the system. And Robert, that is a very good point there. The equalizer, if you want to spend the time to really play with that, it does help because you, you can get that rumble, but it all goes back into having the proper speakers in there too. Because like I said, my microphone is nowhere near the locomotive. Um, I could probably move it up there and you might be able to hear the prime mover better. And the default volume on these are half at 50%. So I could climb that up there. Indigenous People Day, I've not heard it called that. All right, so I've got the microphone nearly right up by the locomotive. So, like I said, I don't know if y'all can hear it, but I have not messed with the equalizer or anything. And like I said, that's got two of the mini cube one watt speakers in there at uh, Wired and Series. John2618, welcome, buddy. All right, so DDE, I'm not going to be able to do right now because that's going to create, require the locomotive to be in a lot of motion. Function mapping, this is really the last thing that I like to set up, which we have to, uh, here we go. So I'm just going to explain this table in a nutshell. Um, these are all the different functions. And then this is what you can map it to. So if you want half speed, that would be CV276. You set the function number that you want to set that to. So if you want half speed to be at function 6, you set 1.276 to 6. And let's see. So as far as doing this one, I'm going to get my programmer back. 
and we're going to move a few things around. So they have their horn at uh, function two, short horn at function three. Four is actually the dynamic break, which they have the grade crossing signal at function nine. So I actually like to move the grade crossing signal to function four. So I'm going to take CV278 right here. And I'm going to put that at a value of four. Okay. So now when I hit the four button, All right, so, but it will also enable the dynamic braking because I haven't moved it yet. So I'm actually going to move dynamic braking down to function 10. What is function 10? Straight to 8. So that is basically putting the locomotive at full notch. So I'm going to move straight to 8 to function 9. So let's see. Straight to 8 is CV301. I want to move that to function 9. And then I want to move dynamic brake, which is CV299, to function 10. All right. And of course, there's a lot of other functions that you can put in there. You can have up to 28 functions. Probably another good one is, you know, we got our FX3, which is set at function 24. Um, instead of using a headlight dimmer, which would be F7, I'm probably going to take that FX3 output, which is function 259. So 259, and I'm going to set that to a value of 7. All right. All right, Norman. Take care, buddy. So it looks like we got Boulder Creek Yard and Humanity Junction in a deep conversation on DCC systems. And I'm assuming that it has to do with the DR5000 by DigiKeys. All right, enabling automatic effects. So this is a really cool feature. If you want it, you don't have to have it. This would be if you know your horn signals. Now... We all know that moving a locomotive forward is going to be uh, blowing the horn twice. Uh, moving the locomotive in the reverse direction is blowing the horn three times. For the older eras, that would be your steam era and your transition era, there is a third horn signal, which is at the stop position, you would blow the horn a single time. So that is something else, and I might not be at the right page on that one. That might be back up a couple of pages. But that is the next function that I am looking for at programming. I think it was under automated sound effects. Should be right above the equalizer. Fireman Fred. Of course, with this thing being 87 pages, it's not real simple as to exactly where you're going to find it. Forty-one. Here we go. Or it might be further down. Well, let's see here. Y'all give me just a second while I try to find it. It's 
You would think it would be in configuring sound effects, right? Or automated sounds. Let's go to sound effects. Prime over, coupler. Man, I do not know why my thing's wanting to jump like that. All right, we're just going to continue. If I come across it, great. If not, that's fine too. Go to this page. And here's your NMRA legacy function outputs, blah, 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 blah. What the heck? All right, for those who are wanting to use DC mode, here's your analog mode stuff here. Just subtract 32 from CB114. So CB114, that's where we were talking about the locomotive coming straight on. When you put the locomotive on the track. So now... I'm going to turn the locomotive off. All right, now you probably don't hear it. All right, and I'm still going through. Current Keeper talks about that. GTEL operations. That's uh, with your uh, prime mover for the slab side veranda, big blows and uh, A's and big blow B's. We won't need to deal with that. Backfire. Okay, gen sets. Yep, yeah, we are past everything that I need to go over on that. So I'm going to go ahead and close this out. Let's get back on the locomotive. And, all right, so I've got my locomotive there. You can hear the horn blow. I'm going to move the microphone up there so that way y'all can hear it a little better. All right, so right now y'all should not be hearing anything, and that's because the locomotive is not on. So we got a bell. We've got a horn, short horn, gray crossing. Now, let's see, let's check the lighting functions. So I should have headlights on and I can't tell. Let's check the backup lights. Oh, that's not good. We ain't got no lights. So I might have to take this thing back apart later and see why I don't have any lights. Seven? Well, that's not good. And, it, and like I said, this is a used locomotive, so there could be a potential that the bulbs could all be dead. Nope, I've got headlights on the back now. That's weird. All right. Headlights on the front. Well, I've got a, one backup light. But I'm not seeing any ditch lights. So that's really weird. All right, so let's go ahead and start her up anyways.
here we go. And of course, with dirty track, I'm just going to want to do that. Come on. All right, well, that's the problem. And that's the only downside when you have dirty track is once it cuts off, it won't continue moving. Yep, I've got dirty track, y'all, so y'all are just going to have to bear with me on this one. All right, we're going to try this again. And it could be the locomotive. Like I said, this is a used one. Of course, with that momentum, it, it doesn't want to stop. And I totally forgot I had a building sitting on the layout. And so, yeah. Like I said, if you don't get dirty track, it will actually work. Yeah, Dwight, I need to clean that track. You're exactly right. I have been neglecting it, and that's because some of my locomotives actually work on it, where others do not. All right, change that. So, go back here so now I'm gonna have to contact the customer and be like why did you send me a locomotive oh god that is dirty oh man I wish y'all could see these wheels these wheels are bad so yeah maybe it's not my track after all so don't just do maintenance on your track. Clean your locomotives, too. I don't know if y'all can see how bad those... Oh, you really can't tell. It's too pixelated. But there is gunk all over these wheels. 
I don't know if y'all can see that on my finger or not, or my thumb. Yeah, y'all can't. Yeah, there's gunk all over those wheels. So, all right. Yeah, Robert, I accidentally put a building over there just for the time being. I took a couple of pictures, and I was just trying to look at a few things. And um, so, yeah. All right, so good news is we got the sound programmed in it, which is what he was wanting. Uh, bad news is, is I don't know what the status is on these headlights. And for those who came in late, this is the box that came in. And for those who know, this is like first gen Atherin Genesis. Uh, this locomotive, I think, might have been produced like in the mid 2000s. So, yeah, who built a building on top of the tracks? Uh, I did. So, yeah, and that is frustrating, you know, because if you don't clean your locomotive wheels, cleaning track does nothing for you. It does nothing for you. So, um, yeah, it's definitely the wheels. The wheels are in real bad shape. So I'm going to have to clean those um, so that way I can take it and demo it. And that's just something I'm going to have to look at on some of these other locomotives and just tell people, hey, if you're going to send me something, make sure it works, you know, it's clean and whatnot. Because I still have... I've got these two to do for you CN and Norfolk Southern fans. But these are older locomotives as well. I've got this one to do. This is a Riva Rossi. This one's going to be fun. Oh, Lord. But here we go. A Heisler. It's not a Shea. It's similar to a Shea, but it's a Heisler. But there is foam all over it, so that one's going to need a deep clean. I don't know what's up with that. So that one's going to be fun. Yeah, I know, right? Throw them in the dishwasher. And here's the last one I've got to do. This one's going to be fun. And it comes with the tender. There we go. And this is brass. So that's going to be real fun to try to figure out how to do. Which I probably will not do that one live. I'll probably do that one separately. But no, the Ather ones... They're simple, you know, to get the decoder. I mean, it, it took me no time to get that decoder installed. Um, but when you, you know, face with either dirty track, which would be my fault, or dirty wheels with the customer's fault, um, it does make it to where testing and programming and things like that doesn't always go through. So... Do it live. We want to see the smoke. Well, he, the problem is it's not going to be the smoke because I'm not going to short anything out. It's going to be the problem of is if it'll even work because I have never done steam or not steam, but I've never done brass. 
Oh, and I do have some other ones. Um, I was actually thinking about doing this one today, but I need an adapter for it. And I've done a handful of these. These are fun. Um, ON30. So it's O scale, but it uses HO track. So those are a lot of fun to do too. And I've got the decoder for it, speaker, gasket. I just need the wire harness for it. So that way I don't have to do a complete solder job on it. And let's see here. I've got one more ON30 that I'll have to do. And these I don't mind doing live. All right, this one here is a two truck Shea. And that's an ON30 as well. So that would be a pretty fun one to do, I would think. So, but anyways, that's the top. <laughs> Does the top shelf of the dishwasher work better than Super 77? That's a good question. Very, very good question. So. All right, Bernard, take care, buddy. Oh, Heath, I didn't know you had firstborn. Does, does the uh, train inspector, does that count? So, all right, y'all. Well, I've been on here for more than two hours, and, yeah, I just wanted to share with you, you know, doing the basic installation of a decoder install, going through the Soundtracks manual, programming it. I've got it programmed the way I want it programmed, and it actually works the way I want it to work. Um, headlights and stuff. I'm assuming they have to be dead uh, because they were not working or one of them's working, but one of them's ain't like the back one, you know, got two headlights, one's working, one's not. And I soldered the wires together before I even put them in. So, so no thumbs down. Well, that's a good thing, I guess. Um, I would expect to get a whole bunch of thumbs down there at the end. So, all right, guys, y'all be safe out there. I will catch y'all on the flip side. Happy railroading, y'all.